I'm Mila Kola, the Director of Libraries and Archives in the Center for Humanities and the History of Modern Biology. Thank you for attending this lecture, which is a part of CCHL's Frameship series. Uh, the Frameship examines the social, cultural, and historical sides of working in an academic institution like our Cosmic Harbor Laboratory. The series is open to all members of Cosmic Harbor Laboratory community and tries to elevate awareness, spark meaningful dialogues, and cultivate inclusivity. It is co-sponsored by human resources, research operations, library and archives, and the office of DER. And I would like now to uh, introduce our speaker, Alistair Sponsor. Alistair has been a historian of the life sciences in the CCHL Center for Humanities and History of Modern Biology since 2019. He also teaches in the history department at Tufts University. He received his PhD in history of science from Princeton and had postdocs at the Smithsonian at, and at Harvard. He then joined the faculty at Vanderbilt University, where he published his first book, Darwin's Evolving Identity. I strongly recommend you to read it. It's a fantastic book, and we have it in the library. He's also an editor on two volumes of the correspondence of Charles Darwin. And we are lucky that he decided to come to work for us. Since coming to see the chill, he has helped to expand the projects of the Center for Humanities, and he has presented his research based on our archives materials all around the world, and I mean it. You can talk to him after his lecture, and it is, he, you probably learned geography through <laughs> presentations and talking about our postcardal laboratory. Anyway, Alistair, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Mila. Thanks to everyone for being here. Can you hear me OK? Uh, let's see. So. Um, I'm grateful to, to be here and speaking in the Frame Shift series. And I've, I've been asked to, to contribute some thoughts today about Charles Davenport, who, at the time he died 80 years ago, uh, was described in the death notice of the New York Times. You might notice that's 80 years ago this very week, um, as a noted geneticist. And more recently, he's been remembered in very different terms, uh, probably most uh, provocatively as Hitler's favorite American. So we're talking about a, a person whose activities and legacy have spanned uh, the broadest range of characterizations. Just to frame briefly some of the kinds of things that Charles Davenport did, I highlight a few of his major publications. The first one here was significant because uh, just a, a year after the so-called rediscovery of Mendel's laws of inheritance, Davenport became the first or one of the very first people in the United States to draw attention to Mendel's scientific work from some 35 years earlier. He did pioneering work in the science of ecology right here at the Sandspit. At the time, he was the director of the annual summer school that occurred here at Cold Spring Harbor. Um, his attentions turned or, or his attentions in Mendelism and studies of heredity uh, included studies on a variety of, of organisms, including poultry and increasingly 
human beings. Um, in 1907, he published a widely noted um, article about the heredity of eye color in humans. And he went on to publish a series of books and reports, uh, notably kind of a programmatic statement on the science of eugenics in this country from 1911. An enormous, uh, roughly 2,000 page uh, report coming out of uh, work done for the US military in World War I based on assessment of drafted men uh, using a variety of tests, including intelligence tests, um, to consider the, uh, the spectrum of defects, as he called them, uh, in the population. And then going beyond the United States uh, in the late 1920s, uh, a co-authored book on uh, race crossing in Jamaica. So this gives some hint of the breadth of his work. I want to also frame some of the institutional activities he did here at Cold Spring Harbor. So he was born in Connecticut um, and still as a relatively young practitioner of biology, he began directing the summer school that was the first uh, scientific institution here at Cold Spring Harbor. It wasn't a year, was not yet a year round institution. But in 1904, with funding from the Carnegie uh, Institution of Washington, Davenport did establish the first year round scientific institution here at Cold Spring Harbor. That was the so called Station for Experimental Evolution. And six years later, with another uh, tranche of funding, he established the Eugenics Record Office just uphill. Uh, and so by 1910, he was directing three separate institutions uh, with initially three distinct sources of funding. Um, they were connected and integrated to some extent, and that could be discussed to what extent they were uh, through the persona of Davenport himself and his household. He retired in 1934, um, but believe it or not, he was not finished establishing organizations and institutions uh, in this area. Um, he established a, a, a board of trustees in 1936 for a whaling museum here. It wasn't until 1942 that the museum actually opened with Davenport as its first director and curator. Uh, and it was the Whaling Museum that was to be uh, the cause of his death 80 years ago this week. Uh, as some of you may know, I don't know how widely known it is, but uh, it is discussed in the always indispensable uh, book by Jan Witkowski about the history of the lab. Uh, Davenport died uh, trying to prepare a killer whale skull uh, for inclusion in the museum. Uh, he spent quite some time in the middle of winter trying to boil the flesh off the skull and um, uh, got very sick and died of pneumonia, as I said, 80 years ago this week. So um, why, why are we revisiting Davenport? Well, one thing, uh, these sorts of anniversaries, whether it's the 120th anniversary of Davenport founding the first year-round scientific establishment here, or the 80th anniversary of his death, the 90th anniversary of his retirement, uh, those are sometimes occasions to revisit historic individuals. But we also have the spur of the frame shift series and, and um, my goal here is not to give a, a full biographical accounting. I'll tell you where you can 
get some fuller biographical accountings of Davenport. Um, but I want to offer just a few of my own thoughts and uh, uh, suggestions of some interesting material about Davenport as part of a contribution to the larger discussions that are occurring with the frame shift series. So a couple of the questions that I'd like to focus on today deal with the a, a notion that often comes up when someone who contributed to what appears to have been progress or, or a great accomplishment within science also did things that are reflected poorly with the passage of time. And often uh, those individuals are described as a person of their time or a man of their time. So the first thing I'd like to try to do today is just to give some framing about the respects in which we could say that Davenport was acting in a particular spirit of a particular time. And then I'd like to move uh, beyond that time, beyond the time when he flourished as a founder and director of multiple institutions, uh, to just touch briefly on a few of the ways that Davenport has been remembered. So um, what were the times in question? Um, well, at risk of, of I, I don't want to reduce US history to a, a series of uh, monolithic eras, but I do want to discuss a couple of key uh, contexts. He grew up in what came to be known as the Gilded Age. And if you see the dates here, this is kind of culminating in the period when Davenport um, uh, got his credentials at the University of Chicago and, and came here to Cold Spring Harbor uh, right at the turn of the 20th century. So um, the Gilded Age, famous, of course, for conspicuous consumption and the concentration of wealth in the hands of relatively few people, including uh, the concentration of truly unprecedented wealth in the handful of a very small number of people um, through the rise of uh, various industries such as steel and railroads. Um, you might recognize Andrew Carnegie's house in New York City. Um, and I'll come back to Carnegie in a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then the, the well-known headline of the period when Davenport was establishing all of these activities and institutions here at Cold Spring Harbor was the progressive era, the progressive era, the first decades of the 20th century. And I've chosen a picture here from Prohibition, one of the initiatives of the period uh, aimed uh, as it was thought, at improving public health as well as uh, reducing crime and things like that, uh, with some connections to the sorts of activities that Davenport pursued. So broadly speaking, um, I would wish to say that we could see Davenport as a, a man of both these times in the sense that he was very, very successful at channeling some of that immense wealth from the late 19th century um, toward a set of projects that were quite characteristic, not of everybody's opinions in the early 20th century, but quite characteristic of a certain notion of what progressivism might look like. And uh, this is a, a, something that I find tricky when I'm teaching um, in university classes about the history of eugenics, uh, to try to explain what it would mean to say that eugenics was very much, in its time, a progressive project. And what I mean by that is not that it was lowercase p progressive in some abstract sense, but that it fit in with a set of priorities 
of a certain set of people who declare themselves as capital P progressives. Uh, this included a range of things, but among them you could think of technocracy or trust in science and expertise of various kinds to improve the social condition. Um, there are also elements of trying to break up some of the monopolies that had emerged in the Gilded Age. Uh, I mentioned prohibition already. And also, as many of you will know, in this period, uh, a absolutely virulent strain of nativism or anti-immigrant sentiment in the first couple of decades of the 20th century. So uh, let me talk a little bit about how it is that um, Davenport went about channeling some Gilded Age wealth toward, again, what in the terminology of the time, and certainly in, in Davenport's own conception, was the, the real uh, archetype of a progressive project. Uh, and we can see uh, some context or, or even some precedent for how Davenport sought to go about this through one of those wealthy individuals of the, um, of the Gilded Age. Andrew Carnegie, the, the Scottish-born American steel magnate, uh, in 1889 published a, a treatise called The Gospel of Wealth, which laid out his program or his rationalization, his justification for his own approach to disposing of or using the enormous wealth that had been concentrated uh, in his own hands. What he argued in this, again, this gospel of wealth, as it was called from 1889, was that great fortunes of, of the sort that he possessed ought not to be distributed directly to those in need. He said even the poorest people, in his opinion, could be convinced that charity as a form of direct handout was counterproductive. It was a, an explicitly paternalistic philosophy wherein the person of wealth, the man of wealth, ought to use those resources in the manner of a trustee or in the manner of a, of a parent, as paternalism would suggest. Precisely because, and, and Carnegie was among those, uh, those wealthy, uh, uh, call them robber barons and or uh, captains of industry in the period who uh, was enthusiastic about ideas that were sometimes have the word Darwin or the name Darwinism attached to them, but they were really popularized by the writings of Herbert Spencer. The idea that survival of the fittest truly applied and was really uh, revealed in the accumulation of wealth that Carnegie and his companies had succeeded on merit in a competitive system, and that this reflected really a law not just of nature, but of society. And in this view, the paternalistic argument that Carnegie proposed is that since the wealth had been accumulated on the strength of, of superiority in business judgment and knowledge or wisdom, that it made sense for the people who had accumulated that wealth uh, to serve as uh, the, the decision makers when it came to the well-being of the much more numerous, less fortunate uh, fellow citizens. In fact, in a, this is maybe the most famous passage from the, from the piece. Carnegie argued that it would be better for the poor if the rich just got rid of their money than gave the money directly to the poor. 
of every $1,000 spent in so-called charity, it's probable that $950 is unwisely spent by the recipients, Carnegie argued. And as, as you might surmise from the fact that Carnegie's name is attached to various performance venues and universities and things like that, Carnegie argued, again, in, in a, if, if we uh, ask how Carnegie himself may have benefited from this, it's obviously uh, easier to attach your family's name to, to buildings and institutions than it is to uh, handouts directly to other people. Um, but Carnegie did this by creating a variety of cultural institutions um, and endowing, endowing uh, something called the Carnegie Institution of Washington which is what Davenport appealed to in the early 20th century, the very first years of the 20th century, uh, to sponsor here at Cold Spring Harbor a full-time station for experimental evolution. And as other scholars have described, you can, can read about it at some length in Yan's book. Initially, the Carnegie Institution was considering whether to sponsor or to, to basically take over uh, the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole um, up in Massachusetts. And uh, in the end, in 1904, they decided to create two new biological laboratories, one at the Dry Tortugas in Florida under the directorship of Alfred Goldsboro Mayer. And here at Cold Spring Harbor, a full-time, year-round station for experimental evolution to be directed by Charles Davenport. Uh, the main building, the uh, main building from 1904-1905 uh, is now the, the nucleus or the oldest part of the library building here, the, the Carnegie Building, just downhill from us, uh, where Mila and I work. And as uh, Davenport described it, it was a red letter day uh, to be able to secure this funding from Carnegie's vast wealth through the Carnegie Institution of Washington for a new institution here. Now, uh, almost as soon as this had happened, uh, really just within a couple of years, Davenport began working on trying to, again, uh, secure money from a large late 19th century fortune, in this case, the railroad fortune that also uh, gives its name to the state park over, um, over in New York. And um, Davenport began cultivating a relationship uh, first with the daughter of and then the widow of um, the, the deceased railroad magnate. And as he wrote in 1910 to Francis Galton, the founder of the coiner of the term eugenics, uh, Galton had, excuse me, Davenport had managed to convince uh, Mrs. Harriman to support the purchase of an 80-acre uh, parcel of property to establish the eugenics record office, uh, again, just uphill from where we are now. So um, what are we to make of uh, these activities as so-called progressive activities? Well. Yikes, I've got a double microphone. Excuse me for that. Um, so Davenport um, was certainly a believer in the value of scientific research, um, which is characteristic of the broader technocratic or, or uh, uh, confidence in expertise that was one element of progressive ideology in this period. Um, Probably the most well-known individual of the, of the progressive era was Teddy Roosevelt. 
Uh, just around the time that the ERO was established, Roosevelt was in between having been president for almost eight years. Uh, he, he became president when William McKinley was shot, so Vice President Roosevelt uh, became president. He was reelected, um, served for, for just about eight years, and then um, and did so as a member of the Republican Party, which had some 70, 60 to 70 years earlier been established as the radical party of abolition, abolition of slavery, um, but which with McKinley in the late 19th century had uh, become a party, especially McKinley's branch or version of the party, much more closely established to uh, the great wealth of the late uh, 19th century. Roosevelt, uh, left the Republican Party and in 1912 uh, ran again for president uh, against his hand-picked incumbent from the Republican Party, Taft, uh, on the progressive party platform. And uh, I've mentioned this already, but uh, within Roosevelt himself, we can see some of the ways in which it's quite difficult to plot or, or project back the contours of today's politics onto uh, the politics of the past. So Roosevelt, for example, um, was popular and in some respects populist, but he was a patrician. He's an incredibly wealthy man. Um, he was interested in, in uh, breaking up monopolies, uh, and he was interested in creating national parks and setting aside uh, plots of land uh, to become federal property for the enjoyment of visitors. But within that environmental impulse, um, and I, I, I won't go into too much detail about preservationism versus conservationism, this is not an ethos of management of resources. It's an ethos of, of preserving, which has dimensions of keeping out as well as uh, preserving. Uh, basically, uh, an idea that uh, uh, you reserve things away from uh, certain kinds of human activities. And that was of a piece as well with an intense kind of nativism, racism, and anti-immigration uh, sentiment. And Roosevelt didn't win that 1912 election. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, another problematic figure, Woodrow Wilson uh, won that election, as you know. Uh, Roosevelt, uh, as he uh, moved into what would be a kind of retirement, wrote to Davenport praising uh, a I, I seem to have lost a slide here. I was going to give you a transcription. Uh, here we go. I've got it out of order. Um, praising some of Davenport's writing around the time of the founding of the Eugenics Record Office. And I, I mentioned the 1911 uh, text on heredity in relation to eugenics. This is a, a remarkable screed uh, by Roosevelt embracing Davenport's science and his politics, and uh, really making plain that Roosevelt uh, supported a kind of um, uh, application of science to the preservation of national slash racial purity. Um, and as you can see, obviously, Davenport uh, was cultivating the relationship with Roosevelt by sending the, sending the word to him, um, as, of course, Davenport did with many, many of the, uh, the wealthy supporters of the, of the institutions here from uh, the population in the area. Um, now, the, I want to, in addition to Roosevelt, give a few other roughly contemporaneous assessments of Davenport, too. Um, 
One of these was a letter of recommendation or a letter of comment to the Carnegie Institution of Washington in that period just before 1904 when Davenport was uh, soliciting their support. The biometrician, anthropometrist, uh, and eugenicist Carl Pearson in London had been visited in London by Davenport. Um, and Davenport asked him to, to send a letter of support. And we see a little bit of a hint here uh, that Pearson didn't particularly esteem Davenport for the content of his scientific work. And that's a theme that will recur in my remarks here uh, as we look at some responses. Uh, so this is Pearson. Uh, uh, statistician, uh, an advocate of uh, the study of variation, uh, uh, part of the cohort that was opposed to Mendelian ideas of uh, very discrete kinds of inheritance and was interested in studying the continuum of variation, particularly through measurement, quantification, and statistical analyses. And Pearson wrote to the the trustees of the Carnegie Institution, that uh, the thing that would make Davenport a good institutional director was his energy and his zeal and his willingness to be in touch with people like Pearson himself, not so much the content of his actual scientific work. It seems that Davenport also solicited support from Pearson's colleague or uh, retired colleague at the time, the founder of eugenics in London, Francis Galton. And Galton declined, it seems, to write directly to the Carnegie Institution on Davenport's behalf. But he did send a letter to Davenport that uh, I think it's likely that Davenport circulated. And in writing directly to Galton, it seems to me, excuse me, to Davenport, it seems to me, again, we have a kind of backhanded compliment or being damned with faint praise. Um, so uh, we know, of course, that Davenport wanted to be the director of this institution. This is the Station for Experimental Evolution, a reminder. This is not the Eugenics Record Office. Um, this is pre-1904. Um, so. Galton was very, very pleased at the prospect of experimental studies of evolution. Um, and the, I, I'm not trying to quote the full passage for you, um, but it's intriguing. The, the, the thread of the letter seems to suggest uh, that Davenport, again, would not uh, necessarily find himself the director if the goal were to find a first-rate practitioner of science, uh, but rather um, that he might be better off trying to focus on administration of other people's work. I just want to highlight another uh, interesting comment by an arch eugenicist, uh, Pearson, from a couple of decades later. Uh, this is a published review by Pearson, who was by this time director of the Galton Laboratory at University College London. He was uh, the immediate founder of a journal himself called Annals of Eugenics, subsequently renamed Annals of Human Genetics. Uh, so this is not a, a critic of eugenics itself. Pearson wrote of Davenport's co-authored book on race crossing in Jamaica, if the length of title, weight of names, and number of printed pages can make a great book, oh, this would be a great book. It attempts to do the kinds of things that Pearson esteemed. It attempted quantitative analysis of variation. In other words, it was precisely the kind of research, or it purported to be precisely the kind of research that Pearson undertook himself. 
However, when subjected to Pearson's idea of rigor in anthropometry and biometrics, uh, Pearson argued, and I, I again spare you the, the details here, but uh, he criticized the methods for measuring the volume of the cranium, for example. He criticized the statistical approach. The samples were too small. He criticized the uh, neglect by Davenport and his colleagues to establish what generation of cross the so-called mulattoes of Jamaica actually were. So even by the standards of the most zealous and enthusiastic supporter of eugenics, uh, Davenport's work came in for quite a bit of criticism. I want to turn to a couple of reflections from colleagues here at Cold Spring Harbor immediately after Davenport died in 1944. Um, Davenport was the subject of a pair of um, uh, lengthy biographical treatments, one by uh, Carlton McDowell, which is a, quite an interesting document um, for reasons I'll get into in a moment, and the other by Oscar Riddle, which was his official uh, biographical memoir or obituary as a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, now, McDowell wrote in a kind of meta respect that Davenport himself was a great believer in the significance of personal biography. Uh, that, sorry for my typo here in transcribing, but uh, that Davenport, as a eugenicist, thought that heredity was destiny and that biography was a source of information about heredity. And that he himself had written a number of biographical sketches and obituaries um, among them, uh, he had written the equivalent memoir of the fellows of the National Academies for his exact counterpart, Alfred Goldsboro Mayer, who had founded the other Carnegie Institution Biological Laboratory, the one at the Dry Tortugas in the Florida Keys. So Davenport was himself a real believer in the power of of heredity and biography. But McDowell wrote that Davenport's life itself kind of disproved the premise uh, that Davenport uh, was much more a product. And this is almost, I would, the, the, what follows in McDowell's piece is fascinatingly almost a kind of psychoanalytic um, commentary on on some of the ways that Davenport was really shaped by his father's uh, endless forcing him to do various kinds of chores and work and not supporting his interest in science, uh, as well as his mother's enthusiasms in, in natural history. Um, but he's, McDowell says, in effect, that uh, you could not do a, a Davenportian biography of Davenport because his own life reveals just the degree to which heredity itself or, or genetics is an inadequate explanation uh, for the characteristics of a person. And of course, uh, I'm not, not aiming to get into the, the depths of detail on the practice of eugenics and the eugenics record office here um, in this particular talk, but as you know from earlier talks um, in the series, Davenport was a, a complete believer in the, the, both the value of and the duty of eugenicists to study the hereditary basis of all manner of behavioral characteristics uh, from criminality to skill and, and, and wisdom, and, excuse me, uh, genius. So McDowell interestingly uh, criticized um, 
the, the very premise of a lot of uh, Davenport's work. Um, I was going to read you a longer passage from this. I would definitely recommend that you, you take a look if you're interested in the McDowell piece. I was going to read you a longer passage, but I'll, I'll summarize it. Um, McDowell scarcely acknowledged the eugenics work as legitimate work. Um, and uh, it's as though he, he sort of preferred to, to leave it aside. What he did comment on was, on the one hand, the fact that Davenport's great contribution, if there was one, was as a, a solicitor of funds and thereby a creator of institutions that supported other people's work. Yet, uh, he described him as uh, a poorly organized and basically terrible administrator and leader of other people's work. Um, so uh, he says that Davenport, just as Davenport's scientific research tended to be scattershot, he would get interested in something uh, and then jump into an interest in something else and only publish on the one thing much later when he wasn't really interested in it anymore. He produced publications that, that weren't uh, rigorous by any of his colleagues' own standards. Uh, he also, McDowell said, uh, tended to let his, uh, his colleagues at the Station for Experimental Evolution know about his sort of programmatic vision just by changing course willy-nilly, and that it left the colleagues constantly in a state of uncertainty about what they could or should be planning to do. Now, the, the other uh, big biographical memoir published by a colleague uh, at the, the occasion of Davenport's death likewise acknowledged that the content of Davenport's work had been criticized in some cases quite brutally, in its own time, and that there was no, no real scope to refute these um, in Riddle's view in the 1940s. He did acknowledge, unlike McDowell, he did acknowledge eugenics as a field to which Davenport contributed by, by implication uh, Riddle still saw it as a science among the many sciences listed here. And as McDowell had done, he acknowledged Davenport's boundless energy, his, his unflagging effort throughout a lifetime. And he acknowledged that he was a key figure in a period when biology became an extremely central part of American life and, as it says, made phenomenal advances. But, again, not by doing research that would stand the test of time, but by promoting and organizing. Now, in this moment, I mean, this is obviously during and just after World War II. This is, he died in 1944. These, these publications came out uh, immediately in the years afterward. Um, but we see by this period, I think, an illustration of something that the historian of eugenics, Diane Paul, wrote several decades later. Uh, eugenics losing its scientific status, uh, especially during uh, the period of World War II. And I really like this phrase, it's a valuable one, that people began to try to treat eugenics not just as a, some kind of a pseudoscience, but as a context for other sciences rather than as the science itself that uh, Davenport certainly had considered it to be. Um, now, I just, I don't, don't, have too much more time. I want to mention a couple of other, I think, noteworthy assessments of or treatments of Davenport and his legacy. The first one I want to highlight, and you can find some of the primary sources that I already spoke about here, 
is on the website uh, that the DNA Learning Center created um, in, in collaboration with a number of other institutions, including the American Philosophical Society, um, which has an absolutely enormous uh, repository, really a, a remarkable thing, um, on eugenics activity here at the ERO as well as around the United States. And it's a, it's a, the, the website itself, um, as far as I can tell, um, hasn't been updated and it still has some vestigial features of, of earlier uh, web browsing technology. Um, but the sources are still there, and it's both an incredibly valuable resource, something I'd recommend you take a look at, and also obviously a sign of earlier uh, episodes in our colleagues here at the lab kind of confronting and reflecting on what had happened here in the 19 teens, 20s, and 30s. I also want to highlight um, the work of a scholar, Rana Hogarth, Associate Professor of History at the University of Illinois, who I think it was last year, or certainly within, within the last 18 months or so, was one of our fellows, research fellows here in the archives. Now, um, you recall that I had argued that Davenport could be seen as uh, bringing to bear some of the financial resources of the Gilded Age on the, which is post-Reconstruction, uh, which is itself post-US Civil War, finances of the Gilded Age into the early 20th century uh, set of political, social, and scientific priorities. What Rana is arguing, particularly with respect to uh, Davenport's studies of human racial crossing or hybridity, uh, hybridization, is that Davenport was really drawing on a set of cultural resources, tropes, and terminologies uh, from an even earlier period than I've highlighted here, going back uh, to the periods of um, uh, slavery and then Reconstruction. And um, you can, I, I think the best way for you to consult this work is that a couple of the talks that she's given in this ongoing project are on YouTube and other websites if you want to see what she's doing right up to the moment. I'd also draw attention um, to a book that's now, now um, approaching 20 years old. It's Mark Largent, historian at Michigan State's book on the history of coerced or forced sterilization, uh, legal sterilization of other people. Um, in my last frame shift talk, I, I mentioned the tens of thousands uh, or perhaps upward of 100,000 Americans who were uh, sterilized in the 20th century, partly under uh, laws that had been copied from a template by Davenport's assistant, Harry Laughlin, here at the Eugenics Record Office. What Largent argues is that the tendency to focus on Davenport as the sort of powerful agent of American eugenics has been a sort of a, an example of maybe a negative example, but nevertheless on the pattern of the kind of great man histories that assume that individuals can somehow shape an entire age. And so Mark's book is more of a kind of history from below, uh, arguing that the tendency of historians of eugenics um, to, to really focus on Davenport and, and more broadly on the kind of elite cohort of biologists who were, or geneticists who were also eugenicists, sort of helps to, to uh, leave out of the picture the fact that, for example, if a Davenport or a Laughlin offered a template for a sterilization law, it took lawyers, politicians, and advocates within 
those 27 states uh, that took that up uh, to actually implement them. And then it took, uh, he really focuses as well on physicians who really uh, advocated for this kind of work. So uh, this is a book I'd recommend as well if you're kind of interested in um, the ways that the ideology that we see here with Davenport uh, sort of got enacted uh, in ways that, that really affected individual people uh, much more immediately than uh, some of Davenport's own activities. And I'll conclude uh, not with any um, major prescription or, or insistence on how any of us or all of us uh, should, should uh, accomplish the goal that's laid out for the frame shift series, which is to kind of reflect on what it means to be at this institution and those like it. Just to, to highlight um, that there were, again, at one time, three contemporaneous institutions here that were kind of joined in the, the composite identity of Davenport as fundraiser and director um, of all three of them. And it's not an entirely continuous institutional history into the, to the place where we all work now. Um, but it's interesting to, to me to note that even uh, here in the 1940s, before the establishment of the modern Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, um, the degree to which the colleagues who were charged with writing these memoirs of Davenport uh, had already really decided uh, that his legacy lay in uh, creating the institutions and not, not remotely in the <laughs> the kind of content of the science that he had tried to advocate for. Thank you.